Okay, so I would like to thank Professor Dr. Michel Sheren Lorenzen for accepting our invitation to give a talk here at the TROPBEF workshop 2020 about the largest network of biodiversity experiments in the world, the 3 div net. Dr. Sheren Lorenzen obtained his PhD in 1999 from the Department of Plant Ecology at the University of Bayreuth in Germany. Currently, Michael Sheren Lorenzen is a professor at the Institute of Biology at the University of Freiburg. Professor Sheren Lorenzen is also one of the coordinators of the 3 div net. His research aims to mechanistically understand the biotic control of ecological processes and how global change drivers such as climate change, land use change, nitrogen deposition, or invasive species are interacting with this control at various scales. Welcome, Dr. Michael Sheren Lorenzen. The stage is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, Leonardo and all your colleagues for organizing this workshop and for inviting me to give this overview. So I will talk about this uh, global network of tree diversity experiments. And um, you already have heard a lot about these experiments and we have seen great um, presentations um, of some of the specific experiments. And I will now take more the broader look from the whole international network of these experiments and um, try to give you kind of an, an overview about these experiments, about the network, how it has been developed and what are the aims of this network and how um, are the possibilities to contribute to this network. So um, in a way, these tree diversity experiments are something like the common gardens of this century. Um, since we argue that um, plantations in the past, especially economic plantations, have been mostly done with monocultures or pure stands. And um, what we need now is a step towards more sustainable plantations. And um, TreeDiffNet could provide some information, um, not only concerning basic research uh, trying to answer the basic interesting scientific question whether diversity matters for ecosystem functioning but also whether um, we can use that information uh, in a more applied perspective especially concerning sustainable forest plantations so if we start with this aspect of forest plantations we know forest plantation play a very important role. Um, they uh, cover almost 300 million hectares globally. 7% um, of the world forest area is based on plantations and um, they are increasing in size. You can see that from this um, graph, they increase in area um, in boreal, temperate, subtropical, tropical areas. So it's going up, the size of plantation is going up. And interestingly, although they cover only 7% of the forest, um, a third of the industrial roundwood harvest per year comes from uh, plantations and in individual uh, areas, it's even up to 50%. So we have to acknowledge two things. One is they increase in size. They're often monocultures, um, often used uh, highly intensively with uh, input of fertilizers, pesticides, even in some cases and so on. But of course, they produce a lot of wood and thereby also releasing pressure from natural forests. So if that industrial round wood, the 33% would not come from plantations, they would presumably come from natural forest with even more um, negative effects, potentially. So um, as I said, these plantations are mainly kind of these type of um, woody communities. I don't call them forests, it's more a woody community. Um, and uh, so they're even aged, few genera globally um, used uh, and um, usually in, in pure stands. But of course, for these kind of plantations, they face a lot of risks, as you know, higher incidence of pests and diseases, there might be more unstable 
um, uh, towards uh, climate change. Uh, um, there is an, also an economic risk that changing markets, um, so the, the, the um, different wood products are, they don't have a stable kind of uh, consumption, so that might change as well. And um, there have been, or there has been a lot of debate about these pros and cons of forest plantations. And of course, um, society is demanding more and more multiple um, products and ecosystem services also from plantations. So it's, there's a change in the perception of plantations, not only to produce timber, but also to produce other ecosystem services. So um, including also biodiversity conservation in, in some, some instances even. So then the question is, if we presumably need plantations also in the future, and given the fact that monocultures have detrimental effects, um, uh, would be a diversification of plantations be a solution for more sustainable forest plantations? So could we change our way to establish and manage forest plantation from, from pure to more diverse stands? And here in this more applied question, um, these experiments like we see, have seen them um, yesterday and, and today in the talks might be of some help. Now forest diversification um, is an old question. Um, there has been these old German foresters, those that invented the term sustainability, um, and others like, for example, Karl Geier, um, that even in the, in the um, 19th century uh, had big discussions and debates whether mixed forests uh, should be planted instead of pure forests. And um, more recently, of course, with the debate that also um, have been introduced before, starting with the diversity experiments, um, of Shahid Naim and Dave Tillman and, and the Biodev project and so on, where the scientific question came into focus, whether it matters for ecosystem processes and ecosystem functioning, whether you have one or many species, focusing on plant species here as, as the driver of ecosystem functions. Um, so whether there is a positive or neutral or even negative relationship between biodiversity in an ecosystem and ecosystem functions. And these tree diversity experiments, they are somehow at the intersection of those more applied questions and also the basic scientific questions. And we think that the results from these biodiversity ecosystem functioning experiments, they're very much relevant also for managed systems. Um, and since most of them have been, you know, planted, these experiments, um, they were established by experimenters, um, usually on a kind of a open bare ground field. They, of course, mimic much more plantations than natural forests. So all these experiments are usually even aged. Um, and therefore, the comparison to natural forests is much more difficult than the comparison to plantations. Now, having said that, all these um, ideas around um, biodiversity ecosystem functioning relationships um, emerged in a setup of many um, experiments testing that without the problem of having confounding effects of different sites and history and so on. So establishing new um, plant communities, mostly plants, but it has been done also with aquatic systems and so on. But here we, we now be focus on plants. So establishing com plant communities, differing in diversity, keeping all the environmental uh, conditions as constant as possible. That was the first start. In later experiments, like we just heard from Stefan, from Beth China, also the, the proposition that the, environment, the environmental conditions should be as constant as possible between the different treatments has been relaxed in order to study the interaction between environment and diversity. But at the beginning, it was the idea to have you know, a constant, 
um, field, like we heard yesterday from Wolfgang Weiser, like in the Jena experiment, and then planting um, stands of different diversity. And the same idea has been done then also with trees. It has started with grasslands, but then, then it moved to trees. And the first experiment was the one of Julia Koricheva. Um, she established uh, an experiment in Finland, which uh, had this design. Um, it is composed of five species. They belong to, do, to two different functional groups, so um, coniferous and, and deciduous trees. Uh, and it has been is replicated at three different sites. Um, the plot sizes were 20 by 20 meters, and she planted around 20,000 trees to create a gradient of tree diversity from one to five species in random uh, design. And um, since that first experiment, um, many colleagues took up that idea and initi initiated their own experiments. So the next one was then the Sardinia experiment in Panama by Catherine Potvin. Um, then I started the biotree experiment in, in, in Germany. Um, and then we had the Bangor and Gaze Bay experiments and, and so on and so forth. And you see here on, on the right, and this is not the, the latest uh, uh, graph, I will show another one just in a minute, shows that with time, the number of these tree diversity experiments has grown tremendously. And um, um, when you see now the the most recent distribution of these kind of experiments, you can see that we um, cover many different regions. We cover four major biomes. Um, as you can see, the most, uh, most sites are in the temperate zone, um, especially in Europe um, and North America. We have some sites in subtropical to tropical areas <clears throat> and we've heard about them and uh, this workshop is about one of those and, and uh, the idea to establish one, uh, a new one here. And as you can also see, we are underrepresented, of course, in other biomes like Mediterranean, like Boreal um, or others. And um, as you can see down here, we have a website. It's www.treedivnet.ugent.be. And there you can find information about all these different experiments and the background and so on. Just some impressions. So the, the design of the experiments um, was always made by local teams. So there was no one big design that has been replicated all over the world. No, each single experiment had um, its own design. Um, some with very small plots, as you can see here, up here on the left, that is one experiment we have established here in Freiburg, an so-called IDENT experiment. There's a network of these small plot experiments in North America and Europe, um, where plot size is only four by four meters. And with 49 trees planted in these very little plots, to focus on early interactions um, after the establish or during the establishment phase. And maybe after 10, 15 years, these experiments will be harvested and will be gone. Others like, for example, the biotree experiment um, have plot sizes of one hectare each. So with a really long-term perspective, with a commitment of the forest administration to keep these experiments over the next 100 years. So, um, they will be analyzed by our children and, and grandchildren. Um, so very different uh, perspectives on these experiments and also very different designs. And um, also a huge diversity of response variables measured ranging from something like, of course, uh, tree size measurements, uh, litter production, or interaction with other ecosystems like these model aquatic systems or multitrophic interactions and so on. Currently, we have um, 25 experiments, 45 sites on six continents. We have uh, more than 120 papers published, plus some uh, book chapters. So in total, it's around 150 publications, more than 20 PhD theses accomplished. Um, in general, the experiments uh, manipulate different gradients of tree diversity. It can be genetic diversity, so having 
for example, monocultures, but with different um, genetic uh, provinces of one species or seeds sown from different mother trees, um, as we also already have heard. Functional diversity gradients, so having plots with the same number of species, but having different functionally diverse communities. So from plots that uh, have uh, species that are functionally very similar to plots where species are functionally very dissimilar um, to, of course, species richness gradients. Um, <clears throat> there's a huge number of plots now globally, almost 5,000 plots. Um, the diversity gradient now here in terms of tree, tree species richness is unfortunately quite biased towards low diversity communities. So of course, you need the monocultures to compare your diverse pure stands with the monoculture. So monocultures are the most abundant um, plots. It's kind of uh, ironic in a diversity uh, platform to have especially monocultures. But of course, in total, we have more mixtures than the monocultures, um, especially two species mixtures, four, um, six, and so on. But more diverse mixtures, we don't have so many. Um, in total, more than 233 species involved, um, more than 1 million trees planted just for science. Uh, and the total area of all these experiments are covering more than 800 hectares. So it's indeed, as far as we know, the, the kind of ecological research infrastructure largest in size globally. So what are the kind of characteristics of the network? So we have a clear, as we call it, system boundaries. So not every experiment that has to do something with trees uh, is eligible for becoming member of the, the network. Um, and um, so uh, if we look at these uh, system boundaries here on the right is that only experiments can be included that have been a priori designed as a true diversity experiment. Um, we have many requests from people, you know, that have done an, an experiment with trees, uh, maybe on density or comparing different commercial species in monocultures. And they, they ask us whether they can be members because they also study biodiversity in these plots or so, for example. And this would not be eligible for the network because the idea of the network is to identify the effects of tree diversity on ecosystems. So it must be a clearly, a clearly um, a priori design. And also um, studies working uh, in naturally established forests, which are very important and all the colleagues have experiments, they usually also work in natural forests. And Stefan just mentioned these Gutian Shan nature reserve where these um, comparative study plots have been established in China. Um, similar networks is, exist in Europe called Fundif Europe. And there are many of these natural forest studies that also aim to elucidate the effect of tree diversity on ecosystem functioning. But they are not members of the treaty net because here we only talk about ex true experiments. So manipulating experimentally the number or any kind of diversity variable of trees. These experiments sh should allow to separate between diversity and identity effects. Um, there are some design considerations that uh, allow this separation. Um, as I said, it should manipulate woody species diversity, and they also should have a sufficiently long gradient of diversity. So although I so said most of the mixed communities have only two species, all experiments at least have to have uh, more diversity levels than just one and two species. So that kind of excludes many of the silvicultural experiments because in silviculture, there are many mixture experiments where two species are mixed, sometimes with different um, proportions, but they are not included here. Um, so it should be field experiments, no pot experiments, um, and it should account for a confounding factors, so environmental factors like we saw in Beth China slope or um, any kind of environmental variables. So accounting for these variables means either by experimentally trying to reduce them 
So for example, planting everything on a very homogeneous field site or quantifying them to have them as covariates in your analysis, like the ecoscape approach Stefan just presented. And of course, it's not only about timber production. Um, we are interested in multifunctionality and uh, so many different ecosystem processes and services should be measured. The whole network has a double aim. Um, it's about research across the experiments and trying to do research together. And also um, uh, the one important aim is knowledge exchange. And I will come back to that later. A very important aspect is the whole network has no funding. This all relies on commitment. And uh, so if somebody wants to establish an experiment and become a member of 3 net, we cannot support you financially without any means. So there's no funding. Um, all the funding has been generated for the individual experiments. In addition to these um, kind of core group of experiments, since few years, we also have so-called application trials. So these are now experiments that are managed on an operational scale for forest industry. So, I mean, a forester will laugh if he or she would see a four by four meter plot. Yeah. Um, so these plots are big. Uh, operational scales for forest industry. So you can in, go into them with a harvester, for example. Um, they are very much um, also from a design point of view intended to be at the link between basic research and applied research. So they are often co-designed with stakeholders, for example, from plantation industry, policy makers and so on. And each of these experiments should nevertheless have a clear link to an existing tree diversity experiment so that we can compare the, ex the results from a more strictly controlled experimental setting with these more applied aspects. And in these application trials, there's of course a focus on productivity and profitability, but also on workability of mixed species plantations, because that has been a factor in the past why perhaps mixed plantation have not been adopted in large scale industry is because it's simply much easier to work with a single species, both in terms of planting and in ter terms of maintaining them and management, and also, of course, in terms of harvest. And also um, the, <clears throat> the homogeneity of the products in the end is, is easier to achieve in, in, in pure stance than in mixed stance. So workability is a very important aspect of these application trials. So, in a sense, TreatyFNet is something like uh, what Fraser and colleagues have called a coordinated distributed experiment. And the characteristics of these coordinated distributed experiments are that it must be a hypothesis driven experimental study. So no pure monitoring study or something like that. Um, it should be uh, done at multiple geographic scales, uh, locations to allow general General, uh, to generalize. Uh, it should have a standardized research design uh, and also standardized data and data collection and data management. Then importantly, there should be an intellectual property sharing uh, among partners. Um, data collection should be, should be as synchronized as possible. And of course it involves the, um, that multiple teams investigate together. Ideally, it should be low cost, low maintenance, uh, but that of course depends on the research question. If we look at that uh, list of criteria from the Treat If Net perspective, certainly the green ones are fulfilled. <clears throat> the yellow ones, um, yes and no. As I said before, the de design is not identical, all the sites. That is sometimes a bit difficult for multi-site analysis. Um, data and data management, so far the data are stored and managed locally. We don't have a common database for all experiments, but we are working on that. Um, synchronized data collection, of course, is not always possible and uh, 
because the different experiments, they have their own funding with their own schedule and so on. Um, so sometimes there are joint campaigns, but mostly work is done individually, individually at the different experiments. And low cost loan maintenance, well, um, you have to plant a lot of trees. And as we saw the pictures, for example, from China and others, uh, or from the Brazil, the nice videos we saw, it involves a lot of work. I mean, you need a lot of people to dig holes, to plant trees, to raise them in the nursery first and so on. Interestingly, maybe in the, also on the TreatyofNet webpage, you can see we have some standardized protocols for some measurements um, and also rely on standardized protocols from other international projects so that we get a standardization of the data sampling as far as possible. Now, just some few examples, um, what we can do with these kind of experiments, in addition to all these individual PhDs and projects and results like, like um, <clears throat> Clara, for example, showed from, uh, from her experiment and we saw before. Of course, the plus of such a global network is that you can do multiple site analysis. So this, for example, is an ongoing study about tree mortality uh, in relation to tree species richness. Uh, and you can see here, here, there are many, many experiments where we have data on mortality during the first years. And we just um, rerun these analysis now with more recent data um, to see whether survival is higher in mixtures or lower. Um, at that point in time, the ground mean was around zero. So there was no diversity effect um, on mortality. But as you can see from the spread of data, this very much depends on the site. And so it's context dependent. So in some locations, um, survival was higher in mixtures. And in some locations, survival was lower in mixtures. So um, this context dependency is very important to analyze. Another example is where we are analyzing existing data and bring them together, together in a kind of meta-analytical -analy framework. That was, for example, one study which is still in preparation about um, herbivory. Um, and uh, in some of the experiments, um, for example, herbivory was higher in mixtures than in monocultures. And in others, um, it was the opposite. Um, the effect sometimes not significant, but uh, kind of trends. Or uh, a study that has just been recently published in functional ecology is um, a study where we um, analyzed uh, all the experiments where birch, a species here in, temperate, uh, in the temperate zone, has been planted and analyzed the leaf traits of birch and the herbivory on those birch trees and could show that the tree diversity effects on diversity was uh, on herbivory was not so large, but that um, the direct neighborhood actually changed the leaf defense compounds. And there we saw an interaction between that leaf um, defense uh, compounds, tree diversity and herbivory, um, revealing very interesting kind of interactions um, and these were also different uh, whether you look in rather warm or cold climates, for example. So um, even, in, even interacting with climate. One funny study was using fake caterpillars um, to study um, uh, predation on insect larvae, um, where many experiments actually participated, including, for example, Beth China, um, uh, all these, and some of the other experiments we we just um, discussed before. Um, and we see in some of the experiments, we have higher predation rates in mixtures. And in others, we have lower predation rates in mixtures. So um, showing that, um, again, we have these context dependency of tree diversity effects. Or well, finally, a study that also has been uh, published this year um, uh, looked at the effect of tree diversity on the microbial community where we collected samples uh, in the experiments and have sent them to one central lab and they analyzed them. And um, in that case, again, the diversity effects were rather weak. There have been a lot of identity effects, but again, there was on these kind of weak effects, nevertheless, 
uh, also these context dependency. For example, if, uh, if you look at basal respiration, depending on tree species richness on a log scale, um, these relationships change depending on potential ever transpiration or soil carbon nitrogen uh, ratios, for example. So to conclude, um, combining results from biodiversity ecosystem functioning, uh, tree diversity experiments across sites and regions has great potential to first advance our mechanistic understanding of biodiversity ecosystem functioning relationships. Um, also to understand uh, which processes are driving these effects. So from complementarity facilitation to multi-trophic interactions and so on. Um, provide science-based solutions for forest plantation diversification. I think that is very important so that we have evidence-based recommendations for plantation industry. And of course, it also um, leads to many opportunities, but also challenges. So um, the opportunities I think, or we think are that um, it would be nice to have new experiments in regions that so far have been underrepresented globally, that we could include innovative designs within the system's boundaries, um, that also novel technologies might be included. So for example, on remote sensing, tree physiology and so on. Uh, which haven't been studied in so much detail so far. And there are some challenges, for example, proper data management across these experiments um, to keep people motivated to participate uh, and invest in the network. As I said, we have no funding. Uh, so everybody has to, you know, even to come to an annual meeting, everybody has to pay the travel him or herself. So we cannot afford some centralized funding. Um, and therefore, we uh, more and more uh, try to uh, get funding for the entire network. And there are some experiments or some projects now where we have a bit of money to support some joint activities, but it's not so much. So if you want to know more about uh, TreeDiffNet, um, first there's the uh, TreeDiffNet website, and there are three kind of general design papers about 3 net One is in Ambio 2016. Um, one is in ex environmental and experimental botany from 2018. And there was one overview um, uh, in nature, ecology and evolution with this nice title, a million and more trees for science. So if you think about, you know, establishing a new experiments, um, it might worth to think about um, approaching us um, and trying to, to get to join the network. And um, I think um, we can uh, offer some interesting incentives to join the, the network. So one would contribute to very fascinating research questions which has a high relevance and would be nice to add experimental sites and designs to increase the geographical range and therefore the generality. And of course, one could profit from knowledge transfer and also from support uh, from the network partners, for example, for design questions, for the establishment phase or for specific scientific analysis. And in a way, you would be part of a group of nice people as you can see here, um, uh, it's always fun to meet uh, once in a while. Um, usually we attach our meetings to some international conferences or to some uh, meetings of, of uh, other big projects. Uh, and this year, of course, we met uh, like we do now via Zoom remotely. And with that, I want to finish and I want to thank you for your attention and the invitation. I'm happy to, con to receive any questions.